Many people have a fascination with the world of the occult, the world of witchcraft, Wiccan witches, horoscopes, superstition, fortune-telling, ghosts, vampires, astrology, Satanism. Seems to be a common feature of many movies and TV programs to deal with the occult, to deal with the paranormal, to deal, as it were, uh, with the blackness of the supernatural. Uh, what are followers of Jesus to make all of this? What is the biblical perspective on the dark world that so many people have a fascination with? Well, we're going to learn today of the reality of evil. Yes, there is evil. Many of you remember after the attack on the towers in New York City, the then president, our president then, George Bush, was criticized when he said that was an evil act. People today can even deny the reality of evil. Well, we're going to learn that there is evil. And we're going to see the consequences of darkness, of demons, of disease, of evil, and of sin. And we'll also see our magnificent Lord Jesus, our magnificent Lord invading that world of darkness and demonstrating His supreme authority over the forces of darkness and of demons and of disease, and later in Matthew's gospel, over death itself. No wonder we sing. What a beautiful name. So let me ask you to open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 8, verse 28. Can I encourage you to come and bring this book, not this version, this is mine, but bring your Bible. You know, I can see, as many of you can, days in the future, we hope is not the case, that when those of us who believe the Word of God and preach the Word of God are going to be accused of hate speech. You can already see how that is assembling in some ways. If you believe certain things about the Bible that are clearly taught in Scripture, it's regarded as hate speech. And can you imagine, yes, we can, a few years from now where people who believe the Bible, yes, even in church, will be criticized. So let's make sure, although the Bible has been thrown out of our schools, how it's thrown out of many homes, how it's disregarded in the political world, that we, the people of God, keep true to the Scriptures. And so come with your Bible and make sure that what is preached from this pulpit in the classes, wherever you are, is true to Scripture. Now, having said that, let me read, first of all, Matthew chapter 8, verse 28, and we'll read to the end of the chapter, first of all. I want to give you a love of Scripture, not just to hear it on Sunday morning, but for you to love your Bible and to know your Bible and to obey it. And when he came to the other side, to the country of the Gadarenes, two demon-possessed men met him coming out of the tombs, so fierce that no one could pass that way. And behold, they cried out, what have you to do with us, O Son of God? Have you come here to torment us before the time? Now a herd of many pigs was feeding at some distance from them. And the demons begged him, saying, If you cast us out, send us away into the herd of pigs. And he said to them, Go. So they came out and went into the pigs. And behold, the whole herd rushed down the steep bank into the sea and drowned in the waters. The herdsmen fled, and going into the city, they told everything, especially what had happened to the demon-possessed men. And behold, all the city came out to meet Jesus. And when they saw Him, they begged Him to leave the region. Isn't that a fascinating passage of Scripture? Can you, can you picture it? in your mind. We want to understand, first of all, the reality of the world of demonic darkness and evil. I want us to think a little broadly, before we think of the particulars here, of the reality of a world, a world of darkness, a world of demonic activity, a world of evil. Yes, demons exist. Not a figment of Hollywood, but demons are evil spiritual beings. They are 100% evil. You say, where did these demons come from? Well, God is the creator of all, 
and God created all of the angels. Demons are angels. We're going to see they're fallen angels, but all of the angels were created by God to love God, to serve God, and to serve the people of God. Hebrews 1 refers to them as ministering spirits, that there are angels who are there to help us, the people of God. Isn't that wonderful to know? Some people think all of us have one guardian angel. I'm not sure if you can support that from Scripture, but certainly there are angels, good angels, who worship God, who cry holy, holy, holy to God, and also help us as the people of God. And in particular, they're watching over the church to realize that angels, good angels, are watching us as we break bread today. Now, Satan was created by God as an angel, a beautiful angel, a very powerful angel, a very high angel, and Satan, wanting to be like God in pride, puffed himself up, thought he was better than God, and uh, tried to, as it were, overtake God, and so God cast him down. You can read about it in Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28. And when Satan fell, when he was cast down, many angels fell with him. So incidentally, be careful in calling someone an angel. Guys, you call your girlfriend an angel, just be careful. And, and incidentally, when people die, we do not become angels. Do you hear those people, someone died, and they said, oh, now that's another angel in heaven. No, 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 no. When I die, when you die for a follower of Jesus Christ, you don't become an angel. I'm glad I don't become an angel, because in a sense, we're greater than the angels. We are sons of God. We're part of the family of God, so we don't become a angels. Now, think of angels. God created all of them. Some of them are cast down with Satan. So there are two basic classes of angels. There are fallen angels, demons, and there are unfallen angels. So there are the angels who are perfect, who continue to worship God, who continue to serve God. They're there as our guardian angels, so they're there to help us. We read in the Gospels of them coming close to Jesus and ministering to Him. Now, of the fallen angels, there are two classes of them. So, unfallen angels, fallen angels. In the class of fallen angels, there are two divisions. There are some of the fallen angels who are in prison, in a spiritual prison. Turn in your Bible to 2 Peter chapter 2. This is fascinating, isn't it? 2 Peter, Peter wrote two epistles. Peter, one of the apostles, the disciples of Jesus. And in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 4, we read this. For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, referring to Satan when he was cast down. Incidentally, you can take off your mask if you want or keep it on, but you can take it off if you uh, would like to do so. For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell and committed them to chains of gloomy darkness to be kept until the judgment. So here are some angels. They're thrown out of heaven. They're cast down. Don't you find this fascinating? And they're cast into hell, and they are chained. They're committed to chains of gloomy darkness to be kept until the day of judgment. You got that? Some of the angels are there. Jude, over a few pages, a little epistle of Jude just before Revelation, another scripture. Jude, verse 6, just one chapter in Jude, verse 6. And if the angels who did not stay within their own position of authority, that's what I've been referring to, they're angels who did not keep to the position that God had for them, and so they're cast down, but left their proper dwelling, he has kept in eternal chains under gloomy darkness until the judgment of the great day. Are you following this? So some of the fallen angels who fell with Satan, some of them are in a spiritual prison, a prison of gloomy darkness. They're kept in chains, and they are waiting the final judgment. What's the final judgment? 
Matthew chapter 25. Let's read it. Remember in Revelation 20, Satan is going to be cast into the eternal fire, we read. Matthew chapter 25, verse 41. Here's the separation of the sheep and the goats when Christ returns. Then he will say to those on his left, the goats, depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. So hell is prepared for devil, the devil and his angels, but also in this separation, uh, the final judgment, those unbelievers are also going to be cast into hell. But Jesus is reminding us that hell was prepared for the devil and his angels. So some angels, fallen angels, are imprisoned in this gloomy darkness. Now, what about the fallen angels who are not bound? Not all of the fallen angels were put into the prison of gloomy darkness. The angels which are not presently, the fallen angels which are not presently in that judgment are the demons we're reading about here in the New Testament. They are an active, invisible enemy. They are Satan's army. Do you realize that Satan has a huge army? I don't know how big it is. None of us know how it is, but it is absolutely huge. Satan is not omnipresent. God is omnipresent. Satan is not omnipresent. Uh, Satan is limited. He's very powerful. He's very devious. He's very intelligent, and he is 100% e evil. And in order to carry out his evil purposes, he has all of these demons, fallen angels, created by God, but now doing Satan's bidding. Do you understand that? And the, did you notice verse 29, that these demon-possessed men ask a curious thing to Jesus, verse 29, what have you to do with us, O Son of God? They recognize who Jesus is. Have you come here to torment us before the time? Luke, when he gives this account of this uh, miracle in Luke chapter 8, refers to the demons not wanting to go into the abyss. So the demons understand that at some point they're going to be cast into hell itself, and they're saying to Jesus, oh, you're the Son of God. Have you come here to torment us before the time? Satan, I want you to understand this, my brothers and sisters. Satan and his demons hate the sinless Son of God. Satan and his demons hate the gospel. They are utterly opposed to God, to the people of God, to goodness, to purity, to holiness, to the church of Jesus Christ. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you know that. The more serious you take your faith, the closer you desire to follow Jesus Christ, the more convinced that you're going to commit your life to Jesus Christ and live for Christ, you will certainly experience the forces of the enemy against you. Don't be surprised. There is an active, invisible enemy against us. What about Calvary Church? Do you think as we proclaim the gospel, as we seek to exalt Christ, as we seek to preach this book and to bring children and students and adults to saving faith in Jesus Christ and to nurture them in their faith, do you think that Satan and his demons just stand by? Of course not. They attack the very church of Jesus Christ. But remember, Jesus says, I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. But hell itself is prevailing against the church. And Satan and his demons actively promote evil, wickedness. Have you ever been tempted? Of course you have. They promote sin and crime and lies and idolatry, immorality, drugs and cults and wickedness and rebellion. They're sometimes described in Scripture as unclean spirits, evil spirits, polluted spirits. They hate God. They hate the gospel. They hate the light of God, and they love darkness. Jesus says men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. And Satan and 
his demons, their acts are always evil, and they are our relentless… I'm choosing that word carefully. They are our relentless enemy. Turn with me to Ephesians chapter 6, just for a moment, where Paul describes the spiritual warfare. If you're wondering if what I'm saying is true, read and study Ephesians chapter uh, 6 from verse 10. I'll just read a couple of verses from verse 10 of Ephesians 6, where Paul describes not only the spiritual warfare, but the wonderful armor that we have the armor of God. Finally, says Paul, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of His might. You need to be strong to resist the enemy is the point. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able, may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. The devil is there to knock you down. The, de the, the, the devil is there to discourage you, to attack you, to destroy your family, to destroy the church, to destroy the Christian witness that you have. As you tr serve God, I can guarantee that Satan and his army are trying to mess it up as best as they can, but stand strong. When you have the armor of God, you can resist the enemy, but be aware of the schemes of the devil. Verse 12, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. Our enemy is not one another. Sometimes in church we fight one another. That's not the point, is it? No, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers. Here's a description of the invisible army of demons. Against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Just think, you say, well, I don't see them. No, that's the that's the part of the problem, isn't it? There is an invisible, wicked army against the people of God. Now think back to our passage. Our Lord Jesus Christ has said to His disciples in verse 18, let's, let's go over to the other side. As they're going over to the other side, as we saw last week, there is this tremendous storm, and uh, the disciples are afraid. Jesus stands, the majestic Christ, and says, peace be still, and there's a great calm. And the disciples say, what kind of man is this, that even the wind and the sea obey him? Now, why did they go to the other side? I think if it was one of the disciples, I would say, you know, we've survived that storm, and, and all we're doing is, is uh, meeting these crazy men who are full of demons, and the people tell us they don't want us. That was a wasted trip. No, it wasn't. By the way, when Jesus says, let's go over to the other side, we always go to the other side. What's on the other side? Verse 28, the country of the Gadarenes. Jesus and His disciples now are in Gentile territory. Isn't that wonderful to know that when Jesus comes, He comes not just to Israel, yes, first Israel, but God's love embraces the whole world. It embraces the Gadarenes. It embraces men who have given themselves over to demons. And having survived a storm at sea, they now get into a storm when they reach the land of the Gadarenes. What a reception they receive. Two demon-possessed men meet Jesus and His disciples. With the coming of Jesus to earth, there is an increased activity of demonic, of, uh, of demons. That's not surprising. And these men we read, live in the tombs. Imagine that. That's your home, in the tombs. They are aggressive, they are antisocial, and they're violent. Mark says that they were cutting themselves. There is a self-destruction in the demonic world, hating themselves and hating others. Verse 28, as they came out of the tombs, they were so fierce that no one could pass that way. They are violent men. They are hateful men. No one can get past them. These are strong, violent, anti-social men. Are there people like that today? If you notice in our society, there's a lot of self-hatred. Self-hatred. 
self-destruction, self-loathing, suicide. I've met people who've said they can't look at themselves in the mirror. Self-hate. Some cases, people actually cutting themselves. These men are antisocial. They live alone among the tombs, the place of death. They live in a very dark place. They are possessed by demons themselves. Do you really want to go the way of sin? That's what happens. Today, many people are living lonely, isolated lives, not just because of COVID-19, but because of their lifestyle. How many people understand alienation? Sometimes from yourself, but also from others. I almost guarantee that every single person here today has a problem relationship in their life. Maybe your own family. Maybe you're divorced. And maybe you've got a problem relating to your father. And maybe you've got a child that you can't speak with. And maybe you've got a brother or a sister that you haven't spoken to for a long time. It may be a business partner that you've fallen out with and you can't speak with that person. It may be your, a best friend that you had 10 years ago that that relationship has ended and you can't even speak to the person. This is a result of sin. You know what sin does? It alienates us from one another. And there's anger, self-hate. People retreat into themselves take to drink, take, take to drugs, take to immorality, uh, and end up in depression. Sin alienates us from others, resulting in arguments, accusations, assaults, violence, strife, divorce, hate, violence. Characterizes our world, doesn't it? Speak to a police officer. Speak to a social worker. Open your eyes, and you see the result of sin. And did you notice that there is nothing that the gatherings can do for these two men? If they approach the men, the men reject them. Your problem of sin, you say, well, I'm not demon-possessed. No, you're probably not. But your problem of sin, I hope you understand it, however it surfaces in your life, is too big for you. You cannot deal with sin by yourself. You try to remedy it, you try to clean up your life, you try to get rid of some bad habit, or you've had a problem with drink and you stop drinking, I can guarantee there's other problems there as well. This is what sin does, this is what darkness does. It destroys us. It tears us apart, it tears our relationships apart. This is the world of darkness, of demonic activity, sin and evil. Isn't it interesting, I find this interesting, that the demons know who Jesus is. Verse 29, notice how they describe Jesus. What have you to do with you, with us, O Son of God? Have you come to torment us here before the time? Just think of it. God incarnate comes through a storm and comes right to your hometown, and you tell him, Go away. Go away. I don't want you. I don't want you. See, the greatest problem of sin is not what it does to yourself, drastic although that is. The greatest problem of sin is not what it does to others, devastating although that is. The greatest problem of sin is you are alienated from God. It is a spiritual problem. Yes, your sin impacts yourself. Yes, it impacts others. But your greatest problem is that you're alienated from God. Your sin is a tremendous cloud between you and God. And these demon-possessed men want nothing to do with Jesus. And did you notice, as the herdsmen go back and tell the gatherings what had happened, you think the gatherings would say, this is wonderful. We've always wondered about these terrible men. And uh, and now the demons have gone out of them. Uh, how wonderful. We, we must learn more about Jesus. That's what the Samaritans did when Jesus said, when the women said to the Samaritans, come see a man that told me all things that ever I did. Is not this the Christ? And the whole town of Samaria come to Christ to learn about him. Not here. 
What are the Gadarenes concerned about? They're concerned about their pigs. The whole herd of pigs went down into the sea. When it comes to it, their lifestyle, their livelihood is more important to them than the salvation and the transformation which Jesus brings. I've seen that as I've witnessed to people. Their life is an absolute mess, but they will not bow the knee to Jesus Christ when, because when it comes to it, their lifestyle, their livelihood, their friendships are more important than following Christ. This is the reality of the world of demonic darkness and evil. Now notice, our Lord Jesus has authority over the demons. Jesus comes and brings spiritual deliverance. With Jesus, the kingdom of God has come. How wonderful! The kingdom of heaven is now invading the kingdom of darkness, the kingdom of sin, and the kingdom of Satan. And Jesus casting out these demons is demonstrating that the kingdom of God is greater than the kingdom of darkness. Isn't that good to be on the right side? Matthew 12, verse 28, a key verse. If it is by the Spirit of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Kingdom of God has come. It's true it's not come in its fullness, but the kingdom of God with King Jesus is invading the kingdom of darkness, and the light of the kingdom of God is dispelling the darkness of the kingdom of Satan. And Jesus specializes in seemingly hopeless situations, doesn't he? He heals a leper. He calms the sea. He's now casting demons out of men in circumstances of overwhelming hopelessness and despair and gloom. What is Jesus doing? He's bringing peace. He's bringing deliverance. He's bringing healing. He's bringing life itself. Perhaps you think your situation is hopeless. Perhaps you've gone so deep into the darkness. Perhaps you've resisted the Spirit of God for so long, and you've gone in a lifestyle and an attitude and a thought process that has taken you further and further away from Jesus Christ, and you have not bowed the knee to Christ. You're living your own life. Can I tell you, no situation is too difficult. Because who Jesus is the Son of God. Even these men recognize that. And he can do what no one else can do. Unclean spirits dwelling in unclean men, living in unclean tombs, enter unclean pigs. These demons are so fierce that they can destroy anyone in their way, and they end up by destroying the pigs. Now, the demons, not Jesus, cause the pigs to stampede down the steep bank and to drown in the Sea of Galilee. The demons' hatred of God extends to their hatred of God's creation. You say, why did the, the uh, demons enter the pigs? Anyone asking a question? I don't know. Matthew doesn't tell us. You say, it's a strange thing. It is a strange thing. I don't know why this happened. You can speculate, but I do know this. From Scripture, also from my own experience, that evil is often senseless and irrational. Sometimes someone will say about someone else, well, they wouldn't be so stupid as to do such and such. They're a smart person. Yes, they are a smart person. And if their eyes on Jesus Christ, they wouldn't do such and such. But isn't it true, as you look back over your life, that you have done stupid, even irrational, foolish things when you've been involved in sin? Sin, certainly as we continue down that pathway, it impacts how we think. Have you spoken to someone who's doing sinless things? They're destroying themselves. I've spoken to, to uh, drug addicts and say, do you, do you get really uh, happiness with this lifestyle? No, no, I, I don't. It's a terrible lifestyle. Well, why don't you stop? 
Well, I really can't. Why did you do such and such? Well, I really can't explain that. Sin makes you do foolish and irrational things. Here is a man who's happily married to a beautiful Christian godly woman. And he does something very stupid, and he does something very sinful. He leaves that beautiful godly woman and has an affair with some other woman. And when you look at the other woman that he has chosen, and you look at her, and you look at his beautiful wife that he's left, you say, what are you thinking about, man? I mean, if you're going to leave your wife, why would you choose her? She seems an ugly person. Even externally, you can see the hardness in her. And she's certainly an ugly person inside that would destroy your marriage. What have you done? What's happened? Sin makes us do stupid, irrational things. That's why you've got to keep your eyes on Christ. And sin, can I remind you, I've said this before recently, sin never, ever ends well. Yes, you get temporary pleasure. Yes, it seems very thrilly, thrilling at the moment, young man. But sin, when you choose that path, it never ends well. The way of the transgressor is hard, and it always leads you down, down, down. The very pigs are destroyed as they come steep down that bank. A demonstration of evil and the result of evil, because the very wages of sin is death. Their magnificent Lord, He directly confronts sin and the demons and evil and death, and He is victorious. John writes in 1 John 3, verse 18, uh, verse 8, that the Son of God appeared to destroy the works of the devil. Why did Jesus come to earth? One answer is, He came to destroy the works of the devil. We by ourselves can never destroy the works of the devil. We ourselves can never be victorious by ourselves. Our Lord Jesus is the only one who can liberate us from our desperate situation and reconcile us to God, to ourselves, and then to others. At the cross, the cross of Christ, what happened? Our Lord Jesus triumphed over death and darkness and Satan. Paul writes in Colossians 2, 15, that our Lord disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them. That was the victory of the resurrection, demonstrating that our Lord Jesus had gone into the darkness, had gone, had taken on the devil and his demons and rises victorious. And therefore, He has all authority to deliver you, what, from the kingdom of darkness. And to deliver you, as Paul says in Colossians 1, into the kingdom of His beloved Son. Everyone here today is either in the kingdom of darkness or in the kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ. You see, how can I be transferred from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light? The only one who can do it is Jesus Christ. He's the reconciler. He's the only one who can defeat sin. He's the only one, as we'll see in a minute, who can forgive sins. Peter says, we're called out of darkness into His marvelous light. For followers of Jesus, isn't it wonderful to live in the light? When you've had a taste of the darkness, you celebrate the victory of Christ, that He has authority over the demons Himself. Now, very quickly, our Lord Jesus has authority not only over the demons, He has authority over disease. Verse 1 of Matthew 9. And getting into a boat, He crossed over and came to His own city. That's Capernaum. Some of you have been to Capernaum. When we go to Israel, we always visit Capernaum. <laughs> right on the Sea of Galilee, magnificent little spot. And although Jesus is not from Capernaum, uh, that's kind of His headquarters, and it's described here as His own city. Getting into the boat, He crossed over and came to His own city. And behold, some people brought to Him a paralytic lying on a bed. And when Jesus saw their faith, He said to the paralytic, "'Take heart, my son, your sins are forgiven.' And behold, some of the scribes said to themselves, 
this man is blaspheming. But Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, Why do you think evil in your hearts? For which is easier to say, Your sins are forgiven, or to say, Rise and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He then said to the paralytic, Rise, pick up your bed, and go home. And he rose and went home. When the crowd saw it, they were afraid, and they glorified God who had given what? Such authority to men. Authority over demons, authority over disease, and later Matthew is going to demonstrate his authority over death itself. Here's a man who's paralyzed brought to Jesus. He's paralyzed. He's unable to fulfill his physical uh, potential. He can't come to Jesus by himself. A wonderful thing happened to this paralyzed man. Friends of his bring him to Jesus, to Capernaum, to Jesus' own city. You know, if you've got friends or family that bring you to Jesus, you're greatly blessed. I grew up in a home where my mom and dad, in a sense, brought me to Jesus. Many of you are similar. Don't resent, resent some friend or family member who tries to bring you to Jesus. You see, sin is a destructive force in our life, and it paralyzes us. And this man who's paralyzed is a picture, again, of what sin does. And the greatest thing that you can do to anyone in your family, friends, is to introduce them to Jesus. There are many of you who do that. Later in the fall, in fact, in a couple of weeks, Subhu Rajapa and one of our, our pastors have asked them to uh, preach. Pastor Hathaway is preaching next week, and Subhu is going to give a challenge of the importance of communicating the gospel to our very neighbors. That's a wonderful thing to do, isn't it? To introduce someone to Jesus. Do you realize that there's many people here in Charlotte who don't know about Jesus Christ? And as you do that, there are always obstacles. Haven't you found that? It isn't easy sometimes. This man is paralyzed. There are crowds preventing them from bringing him to Jesus. Mark tells us they've got to open the roof and lower him down. Matthew uh, doesn't give us that, that detail. Uh, but the, crowd, the, the, the house is full, and there's critics there. There's the Pharisees just waiting to find fault. But in spite of all of the obstacles, these friends are determined to bring the man to Jesus. Faith in action. Now, this paralytic, what was his greatest need? Physical restoration? No. His greatest need was forgiveness of sins. His spiritual condition was far more important than his physical healing. And as Jesus speaks to him, Jesus almost ignores the fact that the man is paralyzed. Did you notice that in verse 2? People bring the paralytic. He's lying on a bed. It's more of a, a stretcher, a mat. This is not your, your king-size bed at home, uh, just a mat. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, well, you, you're, you're in pretty bad shape. Uh, maybe I can do something for you. This is what he says. Don't you love this? Take heart, my son. Have courage is the point. Man is discouraged for some reason. Take heart, my son. Your sins are forgiven. You see, forgiveness of your sin, not your health, not your wealth, not your happiness, the forgiveness of your sin is your greatest need. And the greatest gift that I have ever received is the forgiveness of my sin. See, all sin is against God, isn't it? We've thought of the darkness of sin. And it's only God who has the authority to forgive all sins. And so Jesus says here, verse 6, but that you may know that the Son of Man, this is a royal term marking Jesus as the messianic king who ushers in the kingdom of God. The Son of Man, as he, he's referring to Daniel chapter 7, but that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. The king has come, God himself. He has come to earth, and he is the only one who has authority to forgive your sins. Verse 6, he has, present tense, 
He has, now ever had, will have, the authority to forgive sins. I reminded us this morning that he's Jesus, for he saves his people from their sins. And as he says that, there is then this conflict uh, with the Pharisees. He's blaspheming. Only God has the authority to forgive sins and rights. Jesus is claiming to do what only God can do, is to forgive sins. And the paralytic is healed and forgiven. He, ro- he rises and he goes home. The proof of his forgiveness of sin is demonstrated by getting up and going home. The invisible spiritual transformation, that is forgiveness of sins, is demonstrated by the visible healing. And this life of this paralytic man, can you imagine a man who's paralyzed, doesn't need to go through rehab to get his muscles in tone? No, immediately, transformation. The man is totally healed. He gets up, picks up his bed, and goes home. As simple as that. See, the miracle of a changed life is far greater than a storm. The miracle of this man's forgiveness of sins is much more important, isn't it, than the miracle of the coming of the storm. And forgiveness leads to transformational life. Do you think as he went home, he told his friends about Jesus? (laughs) I'm sure he did. Well, what's easier to say uh, is the question. Is it easier to say, your sins are forgiven, or to say, rise up and walk? Well, Jesus does both. But before Jesus, which brings us to the Lord's table, before Jesus could grant forgiveness, He knew He had to die as a sacrifice for that man's sin on the cross. Speaking these words of forgiveness, verse 2, take heart, my son, your sins are forgiven. Jesus must have tasted of the agony of the cross. See, when you ask God to blot out your transgressions, you're asking that your transgressions, your sins, will be obliterated by the blood of Jesus. In asking God to wash you, to cleanse you, you're asking that the filth of your sin, your many sins, will overwhelm Jesus like a flood. This is the cost of forgiveness. Listen to Paul in Ephesians 1 verse 7, in Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of His grace which He lavished upon us. That's it. What does Paul say in Colossians 1? I've already refer to it a little bit. Colossians 1 verse 13, listen to it. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of His beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. We're all spiritually paralyzed. Paul says, it was when you were weak. It was when you were helpless. At the right time, Christ died for the ungodly in Romans 5. And the cross of Christ is the only place where you can receive forgiveness of your sin. How can my sins be forgiven? It's through trusting Jesus Christ as the one who paid the price for all of my sins, all of my darkness, all of my evil. Only God can do that. Forgiveness of sin is the prerogative of God. It's His speciality. Matthew is telling us the King has come and has authority in His teaching. He has authority over leprosy. He has authority over disease. He has authority even over the creation. And He's the only one who has the power and the authority to forgive your sins. Today as you break bread, this is what I want you to hear. As you break bread. You take that bread, you take that cup if you're a child of God. I want you to hear the words of Jesus again. Take heart. Be strong. Be courageous. My son, my daughter, your sins are forgiven. Think of the wonder of all of your sins being forgiven. And when God forgives your sins, He never brings them back. Uh, have you offended someone and they say you've forgiven you and then a year or two later they kind of remind you about, uh, about that? God never ever does that. When God 
in His grace, through the blood of Jesus Christ, forgives your sins. He guarantees He will never, ever bring them back before you. The Scripture says, your sins and your iniquities I will remember no more. And if that is the case, why do you go back to them? The devil wants you to go back to them, to revel in them. Don't. They're gone. Psalm 103, your sins what, are separated as far as the east is from the west. Immeasurable is the point. An infinite distance. Micah says that he has cast your sins in the depths of the sea. Wonderful pictures to describe the magnificent, unique forgiveness of our Lord Jesus Christ. Hear his words. My son, my daughter, your sins are forgiven. Father, we thank you for our magnificent Savior who came to seek and to save the lost. And as we prepare our hearts to break bread, may our faith be strengthened. May we have a spirit of humble repentance and look to Christ, the magnificent Christ who loved us and gave Himself for us. In His precious name, amen.